Professor Tripathi, my friend Dr. S.K. Sharma and my seniors and colleagues. It's a pleasure to be here. I think I'm supposed to talk about hyperglycemia management in DKD. Part of it is covered by Professor Tripathi and rest has been covered by Dr. Srinivas Murthy. So I'll be just seeing how it goes. So we'll report it. Okay. So this is, I think we are aware that diabetes is certainly increasing. And almost one third of diabetics, they have some or other renal problems. So that's a big problem. In 2011, it was CKT registry in India. They have published 65,000 plus patients and they could see it's almost 50 years plus males and almost same years of age, the females had DKD, DKD or diabetes kidney disease. And there was almost same profile was there in both of them. I think this is a 34% prevalence as rightly said by Murthy, and it is there well documented. So that thing from our side or from his side. So that is important. And almost type 2 diabetics, almost 40%, and 30% of type 1 diabetics, they have CKD or DKD, and after they maybe 10 to 15 years of their diabetes. So that's the renal glucose metabolism is normal physiologically. If you see in kidney, we have gluconeogenesis, which occurs mainly in cortical cells, and it is the medullary cells which consume the glucose. And if you see, this is the adrenal which increases gluconeogenesis and insulin decreases it, and certainly glucagon has no role as far as kidney is concerned. So that's the three important hormones we have, which and gluconeogenesis and, and certainly metabolism of insulin is also there, which we'll be talking later on. And this is what Professor Tripathi has talked, and we know this normal renal physiology is there. We have efferent and efferent arterioles, and we have the normal intraglobular pressure, and the normal filtration is there, and there is a just communication between juxta medullary cells as well as the glomeruli, and, and this is how it goes on. There comes a time when there's diabetes is there, there's a hyperglycemia, there's an increased load of glucose, amino acids, and, and, and there is a more absorption or reabsorption in proximal tubules, less delivery of the same sodium and glucose in the distal tubule, and there comes a time when you have the efferent arterial gets dilated and efferents are the constructed, and there is a role of the uh, these... Uh, uh, angiotensin 2 also, and this is how the intra glomerular pressure goes up, and this hyperfiltration of this glucose, and this is what it leads to the diabetic kidney disease, and this is how the pathophysiology of diabetic kidney disease starts. And we have many mechanistic links between prediabetes, diabetes, and end stage renal disease, and we know this chronic hyperglycemia. Metabolic syndrome, dyslipidemia, increased fatty acids, metabolism, and there is a hemodynamic, inflammatory changes, cytokines, chemokines, oxidative stress, apoptosis, and lately my, mitochondrial dysfunction, as rightly said by Dr. Tripathi, and there's a mitophagy leading to diabetic nephropathy with extracellular matrix accumulation, glomerular nodular sclerosis, glomerular basement matrix thickening hyaluronosis and podocytopathy, leading to end-stage renal failure. So this is how the pathology of the diabetic kidney disease occurs. And we know that single nephrons are there, and then you have the, the with time, there's a nephropenia is there, the, the sclerosis occurs, and you see the size remains is hypertrophied, so the kidney size may be normal, but they're still having single nephron is having hyperfiltration for overall nephron size, the number they go down. This is what happens in diabetic kidney disease. I think this is what we have seen. With time, the hyperglycemia, there's a cellular injury, mesangial expression, I told you. There comes a microalbuminuria, then the macroalbuminuria, and GFR initial is high, becomes normal even then. Also, the things are going inside the kidney. Then we have the low GFR and certainly leading to cardiovascular morbidity and mortality and renal complications and death. This is what happens in patients with diabetic kidney disease. And, and these patients may also have insulin resistance because of various problems like inflammation, oxidative stress, physical inactivity, vitamin D deficiency, metabolic acidosis, adipokine derangement, anemia, and gut microbiota also, they play a role, and there could be insulin resistance, and that can lead hyperglycemia because of the various mechanisms we are aware, we know that. So, as I rightly said by Dr. Murthy, you have to differentiate between diabetic kidney disease. The so diabetics are not 
you know, they are not immune for other problems. It may be interstitial global nephritis, they may be having adult onset polycystic kidney disease, uh, they may be having other major glomerular diseases, and certainly adult onset hyperuricemia, gout, and these could be. And with age also, the renal functions they go down. So we have to be aware. So maybe part of these patients are having pure diabetic nephropathy. So we have to be clear what we are dealing with. So we have to refer the patients accordingly. We should not keep it ourselves because there may be some factors, maybe some diseases which are reversible and nephrologists may help us in a better way. I think this is what we have seen. So not only we are talking about GFR, one has to take care of albumin labels also, whether patient has albuminuria, micro, macro, and what is the label of albuminuria. Depending on that, you can see whether patient is on high risk of developing ESRD early, or they develop, they can go for a longer period of time. That's what we have seen in previous slides also. And various risk factors, if GFR is low, you have all these mor morbidity, mortality, cardiovascular, and they have all CV deaths and mortality. I think this slide we have seen. I think DKD and diabetes implications are important. We have to be taking care of DK and hypoglycemia in them. You have to be taking care of other things. I always say, ghar mein ek chua hai, ek cockroach hai, to aur dekh lo. If you have kidney disease, look for the eyes, look for the peripheral neuropathy, talk to them about peripheral vascular disease. So this is not the single disease. If it is a complication, other complications of diabetes has to be seen and patient, we have to assess when they need dialysis or hemodialysis and whether they have other underlying cardiovascular problems like ischemia, heart failure or arrhythmias and they are prone to get uh, electrolyte imbalances, hyperkalemia that can give rise problems for them. So we have to be careful that. Standard of care 2022, I think we have to aim for securing the diagnosis we have to make. We have to look for the cardiovascular risk and we have to try to reduce and we see the renal risk reduction also. Our objective should be the only in the glycemic control. We have to keep the renal as well as cardiovascular diseases in mind, look for the blood pressure, control them, and we have to initiate evidence-based medicines. I think we have already talked about GFR less than 60, albumin creatine ratio more than 30, and if it is there, we talk about CKD, and we have, they don't have Every year we have to screen type 2 diabetics and after 5 years type 1 diabetics have to be screened for the, cardi the kidney disease, diabetic kidney disease. This is KDI go, kidney disease improving out global outcome. And if you see all they have talked about the nutrition, glycemic targets, exercise, nutrition, smoke cessation, blood pressure, RAS blockade and dyslipidemia, all these things have to be taken care and as a Physician, we have to take care of antiplatelet aggregating factors, lipid management, RAS blockade, and weight control. So we have to see the overall management of the patient with diabetes and diabetic kidney disease. And we have to target them. A patient KD, o, Q, QI, you know, this is KDI, GO, they have talked about the target A1C should be 7 individual with no comorbidity younger patient. A patient is older. Having comorbidity, relax them, make it keep up to 8 or 8.5 also. And depending on what do they have, A1C can be kept between less than 6.5 to 8, depending on severity of CKD, macrovascular complications, comorbidity, their life expectancy, hypoglycemia, unawareness. If they are unaware, keep it around 8. Don't keep at 7 or even lesser than that. And if they had recurrent hypoglycemia, relax them. If Babaji is not having life expectancy mode, don't trouble them giving them hypoglycemia. So we have to see and whether they have support at home to take care of them. If it is not there, we have to relax the, the, the guidelines or the, this thing. Every year, maybe twice to three times, we can do A1C levels in these patients. Either they have CKD G1 to stage 1 to 3 or even 4 or 5, maybe at least two to three times in a year. If possible, we can do every three months also. I think these are the treatment algorithm. Dr. Murthy has shown us important thing is lifestyle, nutrition, weight loss. We have to continue with metformin up to maybe 30. But don't start if it is going below 45. It's already taking. You can reduce the dose and continue. Less than 30, they have anorexia problems. Stop it. 
Second line, as rightly said, is SGL2 inhibitors coming, coming in big way, and we have many trials to suggest they are renoprotective, cardioprotective also. Then later on, we can go GLP-1 receptor analogs. GLP, DP4 inhibitor, insulin remains the mainstay. Glitazones could be used. Sulfonuria may be newer with lower doses. With no, you know, hypoglycemia, we can use. alpha glucosidase inhibitor can be used on them. And certainly, if they need, we can give for additional therapy also. Medical nutrition therapy, the protein intake, daily protein intake should be around 0.8 gram per gram of body weight. If you have lowered the kidney with more amino acids and proteins, they have more deterioration of their GFR. So it has to be kept. And ADA recommended high protein CHO, uh, no, carbohydrate sources in type to be, to be avoided because sometimes they may have hypoglycemia also. And if you see, these are the lipid lower, this glucose lowering drugs, metformin up to the stage 3 it can be used, SGLT2 inhibitors up to stage 4, up to the GFR of 20 can be used, and then you have other drugs like GLP-1 receptor analogs up to stage 3 to 4, and then we have other drugs I have already told you. And SGLT2 inhibitors, GLP-1 receptor analogs are, are coming in a big way, insulin always remains there as it is. The anti-diabetics drugs, I think again repetition. Metformin, just reduce the dose or stop after the GFR goes below 30. Insulin, you have to be taking care because GFR goes down, the propensity or the, the risk of hypoglycemia is more. And DP4 inhibitors, there are some DP4 inhibitors which can be used, the same dose, some have to be reduced by 50% up to 25% also. GL, SGLT2 inhibitors up to 30 and 25, they are tucking and they can be used. But you may not get the hypoglycemic effect, but they are renoprotective. GLP-1 receptors also, they are there. So the caution has to be taken. You don't use, if you are using in insulin and sulfonylurea, the main problem is hypoglycemia, especially in stage 3 to 4. One has to be careful if you are using insulin and sulfonylurea together. If you are having pioglitazone and SGLT2 inhibitor, especially with metabolic bone disease, because we have reports suggest that they may have problems, both the SGLT2 inhibitors as well as pioglitazone, so be careful because otherwise osteitis fibrosis stica is more in these patients with CKD. Insulin, glitazones, both are prone to get the, absorb the water and, 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 and salt, so if they have edema, avoid them together. Then we have lack of clinical benefits are there as far as G DLP-1 uh, and receptor analogs and DP-4 inhibit, both are working same, so why you want to waste the money? So use either of them, so this is important, caution has to be taken care. And Firenot, Dr. I think Murthy has talked about, important thing is here we have hyperglycemia, we have high salt intake and there's oxidative stress and they lead to the more aldosterone, cortisol, and receptor MR, mineral corticoid receptors are hyperactive. And if they are hyperactive, they contribute to inflammation, they contribute to fibrosis, and the sodium retention is there. So people have started blocking, and we have the blocker drug is their new phenidoron, which certainly reduces the mineral corticoid receptor over activation. It leads to reduction in both the fibrosis and inflammation, so it is indicated in risk sustained GFR decline, end stage receipt, disease, CBD, non-fatal amine, hospitalization for heart failure. So there are 13 to 18% risk, relative risk reduction is there in different trials. Both the trials he has shown, Fidelco and Fidigo, and they have shown that they were. So these are the trials I'm not going to go into care, Figaro DKD and Fidelio DKD. And if you see that this reduction it was 18%, that was over 13%. Insulin, I think, is important. Kidney is the main organ which is responsible for metabolism of insulin. So liver is one, 50 to 60 percent, 40 percent gets destroyed in the kidney. So one has to be careful. And we know that two-third gets filtered and gets destroyed in proximal tubule. And one-third, it also works, gets reabsorbed and works in distal tubule for reabsorption of sodium phosphate and glucose. So, so glucose, so insulin, although two-thirds gets destroyed, one-third is active in kidney also. And if you see, there's an altered metabolism, I told you, the clearance goes down that of insulin, there's a more insulin resistance, hepatic glucose uptake is less, glucose, dose requirements of insulin may go down, and there could be severity of hypoglycemia, and because of that, you have unstable metabolic situation and more frequency for you know, hypoglycemia. 
This slide was shown by Dr. Murthy, and we know the reference is one. If patient has CKD with no uh, diabetes, they also have some sort of hypoglycemia. They may lower down if they have both without DB, uh, diabetes, without CKD four times, and both, both CKD and diabetes are there, we are prone to get hypoglycemia almost eight times. So one has to be careful when treating diabetes and kidney disease. Many times they don't need anything, just the GFR goes down and you stop all anti-diabetic medication and patients, they do well. So one has to be careful not to give hypoglycemia to these patients. And these are the factors which may affect the homeostasis of glucose like reduction hypoglycemia because of reduction in gluconeogenesis. There's an increased half-life of insulin. There's a reduction in, in anti-hyperglycemic agents clearance. There's a decreased appetite. Sometimes they don't feel like eating. There's a in decreased clearance of uremic toxins. Adrenal insufficiency could be there. There are other organ failures, infections, and medications. So all these, they compound, and they are prone to get hypoglycemia. On the other hand, there is a reduction in glucose excretion to the kidney, so hyperglycemia could be there. There's increased clearance of insulin after hemodialysis. So after hemodialysis, they may need more insulin or more drugs because insulin gets cleared in hemodialysis. There's increased secretion of counter-regulatory hormone. The stress is there, all stress hormones, they are secreted and they may lead to hyperglycemia. And if they have hypoglycemia, you have the problems, more risk of, of both stroke, CSD, CSF, and the death also goes down. If they have recurrent hypoglycemia, 33 times more risk of guy dying death because of hypo. So don't try to give the hypo to the patient. Don't over treat them. We have to be under treating is better because already things have gone off and we really can't do much. So we have to have multifactorial approach for individualized targets. We have to adjust the pharmacotherapy. We have to monitor their glycemic control and medical nutrition therapy is also very, very important. So insulin, I think if there's nothing specified, all these insulins can be used. Long acting a patient, most of the time they have postprandial hyperglycemia and fasting remains normal. So long acting insulin may not be needed. Basal insulin may not be needed if they need very minimal. There are some patients who have more insulin resistance and they may need. So that's a different story most of the time. So they need just rapid acting analogs just before the meals. Keep the sugar around 200, 150, 200. It's good enough. Not to give them hypos. That's all. We have to do that. If they are on hemodialysis and, and post-dialysis, insulin label goes down because they get filtered and because the, the insulin is very small molecule and it gets filtered or sometimes adsorbed in those tubings, so they may need more insulin or, and management properly after dialysis. If a patient is on peritoneal dialysis, then the fluid from that, because the high concentrated glucose is there, it gets absorbed from the peritoneal fluid and hyperglycemia come in, so you have to be taking care. Sometimes we they give subcute more insulin and sometimes we put in the peritoneal fluid only and gets absorbed. So patient on peritoneal dialysis, they may need more insulin. It depends on what concentration you're using and how long you are using peritoneal dialysis. And lastly, to summarize our talk, I like to say combination of these two major chronic diseases, CKD and diabetes, they lead to more morbidity and mortality. And these patients often present the most challenging uh, cases to achieve adequate glycemic control. And management needs to be tailored with attention to degree of CKD and ESRD type of renal replacement therapy, whether they are on hemo or parental dialysis. So we have to be take, taking care and not to give them hypoglycemia. I think you stop here. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks a lot.